uh, we are all set to start our session in second half. And two more minutes to go and it's sharp to 15 we will start. Meanwhile, if you know your friends who are who have part, who are registered in this, but is not joined by now, you may please direct them to join. So OK, then we'll start. Now it's 2.15 and uh, I hope my slides are visible and my voice is audible. Any one of you can just confirm? Any one of you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. OK, great, great. OK, so in first half we had uh, a session on how EI started, what are the notification to keep in mind? We have also seen some examples of uh, uh, how EIA was instrumental in shaping many of the. One second, I just. Hmm. How EIA was instrumental in shaping many of the important policies of the country. Now uh, we will see what type of uh, documentation is required when you are preparing an EIA report. OK, because uh, you see when you submit a EIA report. It is also called as EIS environmental impact statement. OK, that also you have to keep in mind when you submit an EIA report. The content in the EIA report is also known as environmental impact statement, but the term EIS is more uh, in use in foreign countries as compared to India, but many uh, people who have uh, started working in the field of EIA from let's say 1990s or 2000 or 2005, they still use this term. So just for your understanding, I'm just conveying you that EIA, sometimes we also call it, call it as EIS. OK, now we will see the documentation. So when you are doing documentation for EIA, first we have to start with the introduction. OK, we, we may divide it in chapters also, and let's say this is chapter number one. So the introduction part you have to mention about the purpose of the report, like why you are doing, why you are preparing this report. OK, then identification of uh, project and project proponent. Proponent means for whom you are doing it. Let's say it is NTPC or any government department or any private company. OK, for, the, for them you are doing, you have to mention about them. Then you have to mention about the brief description of nature, size, location of the project and its importance to the country and reason. What will be its important if the project gets implemented? Right, of course, it will lead to some socioeconomic improvement, increased livelihood of the people nearby, and so many things that you have to mention. And then you have to mention about what is the scope of the study you have followed in preparing that EIA report. And mostly it will be as per the terms of reference. This I will describe you in my subsequent slide. What are terms of reference? Terms of reference are nothing but the scope of the study. OK, so this will form the chapter one of the EIA report. Then second chapter will be project description. Here you have to solely write about the description of the project, like uh, contains description of how those aspects of the project based on uh, project feasibility st study likely to cause environmental effect. And what, kind, what type of environmental effect it will be causing, then type of project, need for the project, then its location various maps showing general location, specific location, boundary of the project, project site layout. OK, and size or magnitude of operation. Size or magnitude means, suppose if it is a mining area, 
its size will be in hectares, like 10 hectares, 50 hectares and all. And if suppose from that mine lease, I am taking 60 metric ton per annum, 60 MTA. That will be its magnitude of operation. Okay, size will be its size, the hectare and just one minute. Uh, sorry for the inconvenience. Hmm. So uh, then you have to mention about the size or magnitude, like what you are planning for. Chapter three will consist of description of the environment. Okay, now here you have to keep in mind in description of the environment, you have to clearly mention what was the study area, what was the period of study. Like suppose if you have conducted for January, February, March, three months. So you have to mention that period. What are the components you have considered? Like sometimes air will be significant component. Sometimes water will be significant component. Like that you have to mention and methodology adopted in them. Then you have to mention about the establishment of baseline for valued environmental component is identified in the scope. The scope is in the chapter number one. OK, so whatever you have identified for that, you have to give the baseline status and base maps of all environmental components also you have to provide. Okay, so I hope chapter one to three is clear to you. And then in chapter four, you have to mention about the anticipated environmental impacts and mitigation measures. Okay, so here you have to give the measures for minimizing and offsetting the adverse identified impact that you have identified now, and you have to give that. Then you have to clearly mention what all impacts which are irreversible or irretrievable. Okay, and what will be its commitment on the environmental components. Okay. One more. Sorry again. Ah, then uh, you have to mention about the uh, uh, significance impacts like criteria for determining significance, assigning significance, and then finally you have to provide the mitigation measures. As I said earlier, there will not be a equal impact on all the components. Like there will be air, water, soil, noise, sediment ecology, coastal erosion, traffic, radioactivity, terrestrial ecology, aquatic ecology, okay, marine fauna, all these things. But on all the components, there will not be equal impact. In those cases, first we have to identify. OK, let's say this project has more on air, water and soil. So first we'll consider this like that. You have to identify. And then once you have identified the impact, you have to do one analysis of alternative. It is also popularly called AOA. In that you have to see whether the scoping exercise uh, results in need of alternative means you have done the anticipated impact. Everything you have done if those anticipated impacts are crossing the permissible limit in a significant way, which you feel that it will not at all be retrievable, right? It will not be repairable. Then in that case, you have to do one alternative analysis. If not here, then where? Right? If I cannot implement my project here, then where I will implement? Okay, in that that in that case, we have to do description of each alternative and we have to give a summary of adverse impacts also. And for each alternative, we have to propose a mitigation measure and then finally we have to select one alternative. OK, that is selection alternative. Now suppose if everything goes fine and you do you does not require any alternative. Let's say you are going with the initial project proposal. Then you have to provide an environmental monitoring plan and any environmental monitoring program is to be given. If, if you have chosen something from NIC alternative for that to be given, then in monitoring program you have to give the technical aspects of monitoring and the effectiveness of mitigation measures, whatever mitigation measures you have provided in this step. You have to see whether they are actually implemented or not, or whether they are actually working or not. In that, you have to give proper measurement methodologies, its frequency, location, data analysis, reporting schedules, emergency 
procedure, detailed budget and procurement schedules. All those kind of things you have to give in environmental monitoring program. Then comes additional studies. Uh, if the project is quite big, you have to go for public consultation. You have to call the public at a particular place. You have to present the findings of the project to the public and then you have to take the comments from them. After addressing the queries from the local public, then only you can obtain environmental clearance from the state or central agencies. Then you may also have to carry out risk assessment. You may also have to carry out social impact assessment and you may also have to give resettlement and rehabilitation plan. Suppose if, if there is one site and you have rehabilitated them from that site to somewhere else, then what will be their resettlement and rehabilitation plan that you have to provide? <laughs> the chapter eight will uh, form project benefits. Like suppose if this a project gets implemented then what will be the improvements in the physical infrastructure? What will be the improvements in the social infrastructure? What will be the employment potential of a skilled person, semi-skilled person or unskilled and other tangible benefits? Okay, intangible benefits, it will be like drinking water supply, right? Medical camps and all those things which form part of the project. And one more chapter which is optional, it, there may be one environmental cost benefit analysis. Oh, this we have to do only if it is recommended at the chapter one that we need to do it. Environmental cost benefit means suppose you have invested X amount. Okay, and you are getting benefits of X minus one. That means you are in loss. One thing. This is one aspect. Second, you have invested X, but you are getting a profit of let's say X plus two or something. 20% or uh, some some incremental unit of two units or more, but it is harming the environment more. Then you have to find a trade off between these two cost benefit analysis and then you have to recommend whether to go ahead or not. OK. The next chapter will be environmental management plan. You have to keep in mind this. This one was monitoring program here. We are not suggesting anything for the management. We are just monitoring, but in chapter 10, we have to give a proper environmental management plan. Here we have to describe the, uh, we have to give the management plan description of the administrative aspects of ensuring that mitigative measures are implemented and their effectiveness monitored after the approval of EIA process. Once the EIA is approved, we have to make sure that all the mitigation measures are followed. And then when you have to provide for summary and conclusion, here you have to give the overall justification of the project. Why you need this project? and why it is beneficial for the society. And you have to also explain that how adverse effects have been mitigated in the report. There will be some adverse effect for sure, how you have mitigated it, that you have to mention. And chapter 12 will be dis disclosure of consultant engaged, like who all experts were involved, what was their background, all those things you have to mention in chapter number 12. Okay, so I hope up to this point, the documentation in EIA is clear to you. Introduction, project description, description of the environment, anticipated environmental impact, analysis of alternative, environmental monitoring program, additional studies, project benefits, environmental cost benefit analysis. And finally, environmental management plan, summary and conclusion, and disclosure of consultant. Okay. Uh, up to this point, any doubt? Up to this point, any doubt to anyone? Okay. Uh, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. May I know? Who sir, is this first? Uh, sir, uh, Surya Prakash, sir. Uh, Surya Prakash, uh, go ahead. Uh. Yes, sir, can you uh, explain these all uh, uh, documentation with uh, taking one examples like uh, if uh, yeah. any company yes, yes. is will, going to establish? It will be during, yeah, it will be during the case studies, uh, day okay. four and five. Okay. okay. Uh, in the okay. schedule, you, you, you could see there are some case studies of EIA. There, that time you will be able to see. Okay, okay, thank you. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Then, what all components are there which uh, which we need to see when doing EIA? Yeah, that we'll see now. So, environmental impact assessment will be like first air, then water, noise, and soil and ecology. Now you have to keep in mind that any activity will have certain noise 
as well as it will require raw water for any kind of functioning that you have to keep in mind. That's why always, always air, water, noise, soil and ecology. This will be the primary uh, components in an EIA report. Amongst that also there will be some, some criteria like some sometime air may be more, water may be more, but these five together are the most important parameters in almost all the EIA projects. And then if the, uh, if the quantum of that work is more, then socioeconomic will al also be considered. So in any EIA, there will be air, water, noise, soil, ecology, traffic, land use, socioeconomic survey, coastal erosion and radiation studies. If you are in a coastal city, there will be coastal erosion, otherwise not. And for all this component, we have to provide mitigation plan and management measures. That is what the prime fundamental of EIA is. The prime purpose of EIA is. Okay, so up to this point is clear. Chat box, some questions are there. Ripu Dhamam Srivastav. Okay, but you can ask me directly. You can, you should ask directly when it is there. Are you able to hear me? Yes, I can. Someone's mic is on. Yes, sir. I can hear you. Any Anusha assist? Can you mute your mic? Okay. Okay. Yeah, so your question is environmental monitoring program. Okay, we'll see. Okay. Environmental monitoring program, right? Ripu Daman, this one you want me to take again? Yes, yes. Yeah, so here actually, uh, you can mute your mic, all participants. Yeah, so here you can see that is the is the word indicates environmental monitoring program. Here I'm not using the mitigation nor I'm using management. Here I have to monitor only. So here I have to give the uh, technical aspects of, of monitoring the effectiveness of mitigation measures. What all mitigation measures I have provided in chapter number four. Okay, I'll give you an example now. I'll explain you in a different terms. Suppose um, there is one chimney stack. Okay, there is one chimney stack. This is a chimney stack and this is an industry, particular industry. Pardon me for the drawing. and. Uh, from here, we identified that PM10 will be the significant parameter. Okay, we identified like that. Now, as a mitigation to this, I have given an electrostatic precipitator, ESP, this rectangular box. Now, I have to see whether that ESP is working fine or not. For that, I should regularly monitor the PM10. Now, it is not like that every day I should monitor. Okay, and full 24 hour, it is not like that. So, I have to Tell them that in non-monsoon, monsoon anyway we don't measure, in non-monsoon, once in a week or twice in a week or one per day. Any any way we can give as per the National Ambient Air Quality Guideline that will be shared with you. So with that, you have to give them a plan that suppose your industry has obtained environmental clearance on 1st of January. So from 5th of January onwards, once in three days, you monitor the PM10 from your state. That is what the monitoring program. That is for air you give. Similar you will give for nearby water bodies and lakes. Similar you will give for the uh, noise pollution management. You will employ uh, noise meters and you will tell them that uh, once in a week or twice in a week in this much hours, like uh, peak hours, morning 10 to 12 and evening 6 to 8, you have to measure the noise. That is what monitoring program is and how to uh, decide the location, frequency and all those things that you will come to know when you are doing the project When you are actually doing the project that you will, uh, it will be very easy for you to understand how to decide all these things. Okay, uh, Ripu Daman. Yes, sir. Okay. okay, so if there are no doubts, we will go ahead. But before that, I would like to ask a couple of questions to you. NCC, you are there now? Yes, sir. 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 Yes
morning also you have not responded okay parvati and i have you are there upasna singh yes sir hmm so can you tell me the initial 3 uh, chapters of a eia documentation report yes sir introduction hmm. yeah. pro project description description of the involvement and anticipated environmental impact and mitigation measures analysis of alternative environmental monitoring programming acha वैसे this was not the initial three but it's okay you will remember something first one was introduction second was project description yes sir okay. and third one was baseline okay then okay then uh, i think we will move ahead so now uh, one second so now what all uh, the basics of eia was required we have covered now okay now what we'll be doing is that one by one we will be seeing all the components like air water noise then sediment ecology socio economics and all these things one by one we will see and you will understand like how if uh, uh, if we are doing eia how it should be dealt with okay but before i start is there, again i am asking any doubt till now morning lecture and this one okay then we will proceed okay so now we are studying the first component of uh, any eia that is air environment okay so uh, as far as the monitoring program and other things are concerned that we will share with you the pdfs but here my intention is to give you the grasp of what air is what all components are there in air and how we proceed for monitoring okay the things which you can read directly from the codes and other thing that i will not discuss here but i'll give you the a concept which uh, we gain by experience or or an expertise which we develop over the time so air environment so first first you should know what type of steps we follow when you are doing prediction and assessment for air environment okay so uh, the basic steps associated with prediction of changes in air quality changes in air quality and as well as the changes are as follows first you have to understand in step 1 we will identify the air pollutants what are pollutants we have to monitor in the project of course pm10 and pm2.5 will always be there but sometimes specific to industry we we also measure carbon monoxides and lead okay so like that in step 1 first you have to identify the air pollutants okay second step you have to describe the existing air quality levels okay you have to describe the existing air quality levels in step number 2 once you have decided the parameters you have to measure it and you have to describe the existing air quality levels then you have to determine the air pollution dispersion potential of this okay like when there is one industry anyway uh, uh, i will coming on that point when there is some industry or stake like this there will be some plumes there will be some plumes it will move in certain direction because of the wind direction and wind speed okay that you have to see what is the potential of air pollution dispersion if there is some potential you have to do modeling for it and then you have to assemble the basic meteorological data basic meteorological data like wind speed okay wind speed wind direction ha huh? wind speed wind direction humidity in most cases we take relative humidity then rainfall and temperature 
at least this five basic methodological data you have to take before proceed for the modeling. And then you have to present the air quality standard. You have to, you should know what is standard you are going to follow. Once you know, okay, these are the levels, these are the dispersion, these are the basic methodological data. Now, what are the standards we are going to compare our data with that you have to present? And then you have to do the emission inventory. Inventory means there may be some four or five points from where uh, the air pollution is getting emitted. And there may be some receptor points on which it is going to uh, go, going to impact. Those inventory you should know. These are the sources and these are the receptors. And then you have to do the prediction of impacts in which you have to do with and without scenario. With and without scenario means one time mistake is there, pollutants are there, then what will be the pollution? Other time mistake is not there. Okay, stake is not there. Only wind speed, wind direction, other things are there. In that case, what is the uh, air pollution that you have to compare with and without? And then finally, you have to suggest abatement or mitigation strat strategies for management of air pollution. Okay, so this eight to nine steps are there which you need to follow for carrying out prediction and assessment of air environment while doing an EIA. Okay, I hope up to this point is clear. Now we will see some uh, basics of uh, air pollution. Okay, so as we all know, what is, uh, what is air pollution? I will not read the conventional uh, definition of air pollution like the, if there are unwanted or foreign materials in a system, it is for pollution and all, but we will see the technical part of it. So in a, any air pollution problem will involve three parts. First one is the pollution source. Second one is the movement or dispersion of that pollutant and the recipient. So suppose this is the source. This is the industry. Okay, and this is the recipient, we as human being. And in between, there will be transport or dispersion of the pollution which is arising from the state. Okay, and this, uh, as you can read here, the transfer, uh, the transfer of the pollutant is determined by meteorological conditions. Okay, so this any air pollution problem will consist of three parts: source, recipient, and transport in between. And why air pollution occurs? Of course, it is the price of industrialization. Okay, disease of wealth because we are uh, we have done lot of industrialization and a burning problem because of burning of fuels because we are burning fossil fuels the emissions out of it is specifically the carbon monoxide particulate metals in terms of pm10 pm2.5 sometimes unburned hydrocarbons are also there then ph polyaromatic hydrocarbons all these are pollutant that also comes out of fuel so that is what the basic understanding of air pollution now the purpose of showing this figure here is you should understand that when you are doing EIA, you should know you should talk in terms of source recipient and transport you should not simply say that air pollution is something which uh, which is uh, introduction of foreign metal into that when you are doing an EIA, you should have the quantified terms which i have already mentioned in my initial lecture okay source transport recipient now we will just uh, we will just see some statistics like this i already told you contamination atmosphere by gases liquid solid waste or by products okay it is a, a threat to human health and the natural environment and uh, air pollution uh, can be caused due to burning of wood coal petrol or by spraying pesticides earlier only we know that fossil fuels but now you see it is by if you are just spraying pesticide that will also cause air pollution okay and mostly if you see it will consist either of particles or of gases. These two things only will, uh, these two things only will collectively form the pollutants in the air. Okay, now, uh, this anyway, I'll be sharing with you the standards I'm not sharing with you. But this news clip, as you can see, every year in Delhi, after the stable burning, stable burning in Haryana, there will be fog. Okay, and slowly because of that, plus Delhi, as you all know, it's a very highly urban area, lot of vehicular traffic, plus some thermal power plants are also there on the periphery of Delhi. So because of all this, plus because of the heavy cold exposure, because in winter times, there will be cold in Delhi. 
and because of that they will not be able to they will not be uh, able to disperse the pollutants up, up to the atmosphere pollutant will be in the initial 10 to 30 meter only because of that lot of people are suffering from asthma that's why delhi sometimes is also called as india's asthma capital okay and as we all know it is it consists of particles and gases so whenever i am developing some technology i should directly target the particles and gases now what are the sources if i go deeper into this what are the sources of air pollution okay first it will it, it can be natural and second it can be man made natural uh, uh, we all know volcano is the one volcano eruption and wildfires or storms okay and these are so big that if it outbreak receptor will always be at risk it, it cannot escape just like that okay second one is man made in man made we have industrial then urban and then traffic industrial you all know uh, uh, any any burning of fuel for running the machinery as well as any uh, emission from the product itself will cause industrial pollution and if it is from a stake it will be known as point source okay if it is from a stake it will known as point source but if it is a mining industry due to truck traffic it can be also considered as a line source okay in urban area most of the air pollution is because of fuel combustion for cooking heating and open waste burning mm -hmm. uh, that will be categorized under the area source point area and traffic it will be in a line right traffic will be in a line so that is called as a line source so as you all know nature man made in man made industrial urban traffic industrial point urban area traffic line so these are the type of sources technically type of sources and administratively those are called as industrial urban and traffic so i hope up to this point it is clear to you now we have to see the classification of air pollutant based on its certain properties so it can be classified in three categories primary air pollutants secondary air pollutants and toxic or hazardous air pollutants okay now you already know what primary and secondary is so you can very well understand that primary are emitted directly into the atmosphere from the source right secondary are what these are formed due to interaction of two or more primary pollutant mostly photo uh, photonic related reaction and third one is heavy metals hydrocarbon or pa just now i mentioned about this in my previous slide these are toxic or hazardous so what are the examples of primary pollutant particulate metal pm sox nox carbon monoxide and volatile organic compounds and secondary are what ozone sulfate and nitrate and uh, toxic are some something nickel cadmium zinc chromium or okay then there are some sorry there are some standards for it i already told you in india we follow nox standard national ambient air quality standard so they have given a standard for it like pm10 should be less than 100 microgram per meter cube pm2.5 should be less than 60 microgram per meter cube and so on so whenever you are doing air quality studies you have to compare your results with this one now one more important type of uh, pollution which are prevalent nowadays is indoor air pollution why now whatever i mention here that was outdoor right that was outdoor it is not being generated inside the house but there are nowadays indoor air pollution also uh, increasing because of our increase in uh, lifestyle and some other reasons like if you see first thing you need to understand that indoor air pollution is more dangerous than outdoor pollution why because we do everything in enclosed environment now you yourself think i am sitting here in my office i am giving online lecture to you you are sitting somewhere else none of us are outside right we are inside only so that means if you see to out of 24 hours in traveling we we will only devote 10 to 20% of the time 2 to 3 hours rest we will be indoor only office is also indoor our house is also indoor so you can imagine the exposure time of indoor air pollution if it is there for sure okay so uh, uh, 
this indoor air pollution is more dangerous than outdoor air pollution. Now, what are the sources of indoor indoor air pollution? Right, is it tobacco smoke or outdoor air which comes inside? Cooking and heating appliances, papers from buildings, material, cosmetics, and drains, and toilet. Okay, in those cases, there must be there will be indoor air pollution. Now you can see one by one. Okay, if you see bedrooms, if you start with bedrooms, there may be pollution because of poor ventilation, dust and dust mites, bacteria and viruses, pet dander or dry cleaning. Okay, then there will be some old clothing and bedding, old asbestos insulation, dust. Okay, I'm sure since we all are from India, and many of you are from North India also, and some are from South. Okay, of course it is a combine, but you would have observed that after the rainy season, many times our walls and our uh, roofs are are moisty. Okay, uh, it's kind of a wet. In those kind of cases, there is a growth of harmful bacteria on that wall. That's why sometimes it will go in black color also. And if there is poor ventilation, after some time you will start inhaling those. You will start inhaling those. That is indoor indoor air pollution, right? Then in our garage, there will be some fans and always auto exhaust, pesticides and herbicides. Like that in in kitchen is the most uh, dangerous one if you see from that perspective because every day our mothers or sisters or our wife prepare that dough they make roti chapati or curry and all those things and when they fry something those oil droplets and all they inhale it that is also one of the reason of indoor air pollution and like that some other reasons also so indoor air pollution is also a significant term that's what i wanted to convey to you now we have to see how these hazardous air pollutants are classified okay these are popularly known as HEPs, HAPs, and, and there are four components basically in this. Volatile organic compound, BOCs, and semi-volatile organic compounds on which my friend Shavanti, who took first lecture, is also working in that benzene, toluene, xylene, and pH. Persistent organic pollutants like polychlorinated PCBs, dioxins, furans, pesticides, carbonyls in that LDID and fitness there, and a different kind of uh, metals like lead, mercury, arsenic, nickel, cadmium, etc. So this is the classification of hazardous air pollution, which are of course not very high in concentration, but even the small concentration of that alone will be able to cause disturbances to us. Okay. Now up to this point, I hope all things are crystal clear to you. Now we will see the types of monitoring which we do in AIA, and then we'll have some question answer. Now, this slide is a very comprehensive slide. In a single slide itself, all the things uh, we have included and that you have to keep in mind while doing an EIA. So, I told you earlier that we only follow National NBI Air Quality Monitoring Program when you are working in India, NACS 2009. And in that, there are two types of monitoring. Okay, first based on the national labor quality standard parameters and second one is based on the site and parameter selection based on some specific things like background and other areas, rural, semi-urban, urban, industrial, sensitive. So we'll see the first one now. In that there are two types, manual monitoring, automatic analyzer. In manual monitoring, we go and uh, collect the air sample using a high volume sampler or a low volume sampler also, sometimes using some compact handy Handle sampler also. Then we bring it to the lab. We do gravimetric analysis. We do chemical analysis and we uh, categorize uh, and we characterize all these components. Okay, manual monitoring, SOX, NOX, all these things, gravimetric and chemical analysis. We do wet chemical analysis also. Okay, then automatic analyzer. These are sophisticated analyzer. Okay, in which quality assurance and quality check both have been done, and these are instant data generation. You would have seen in Delhi or somewhere that there is a very big screen. It is regularly showing the uh, concentration of PM10, PM2.5, SOX, and NOx in the atmosphere. Those are called automatic analyzers. Okay, and uh, 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 so this was National Ambient Air Quality Standard Parameter Manual Monitoring and Automatic Analyzer. Now, second one is you are going somewhere and you are you have to customize something. So in that case, we have to select the site and other things properly. So in that way, first we will see how we will select the site. 
So this your site should be away from source and other interferences. OK, the inlet of your uh, sampler should be 15 meter away from source or traffic artery. And its height should be more than 3 meter, preferably between 3 to 10 meter. OK, or if you are putting near a wall, it should be double of the height of the nearby wall or any obstruction, whatever there is. Whatever air you are getting it, it should be free flowing, free flowing and well mixed. Means uh, it should be a composite sample. And the elevation angle of, uh, of your uh, sampler should be less than 30 degree. OK, and if suppose two samplers are there, at least in between them two meter uh, distance should be there. Though this kind of condition uh, does not occur very frequently that two samplers you require. But sometimes if there are two opposite direction, you may require two co-located samplers. OK, or sometimes you may do alternate monitoring also. Like one sampler you will put in initial three days, same sampler you will put in next three days. OK, like that also it will go. Now, this is site selection. Now you have to choose the parameter. So if it is a sensitive uh, location, SOX now will be included. It is a health impact station or pollutant. If it is population and exposure, all the criteria pollutant which is given in the code. If it is on the curve side, curve side means that median you would have seen on road. That is called as curve. The, 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 the yellow, black, yellow, black series of stone is called as curve. OK. So uh, uh, the traffic intersection in that criteria pollutants plus carbon monoxide. Why carbon monoxide? Because from gaseous pollutant, it is one of the high chance gaseous pollutant which can be emitted from the vehicles. And suppose if you are installing it in downtown, downtown means there is an urban area, but uh, there will be one area uh, in every city now where you will get some cheaper price things or it's a kind of a low lying area or uh, 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 what example I can give you. In every city there will be one area na, like uh, where you will get a local market, cheaper things and sometimes pirated products also. That is called as downtown. In, it's a foreign term and foreign everywhere downtown will be there. So there you have to accumulate, you have to take 50 meter away from traffic intersection or the criteria pollutant plus ozone. Like that you have to carry out the monitoring of Air in those kind of situation. OK, so I hope up to this point it is clear to you. Now uh, uh, I want you to ask some doubts up to this point. Hello, Do you sir. have some doubt up from here? Go ahead, go ahead. So actually. Uh, Hello, yes. Can you show the can you show the on the short chart, national ah, sure. air quality. So the manual monitoring. So as you mentioned, the gravimetric. So can you can you slightly can you speak slightly slightly louder? So the manual monitoring. It's a continuum monitoring or it could be an interval monitoring. Whether the monitoring is only by the gravimetric or like you can use any other. Ah no. Uh, <laughs> It is what I'm saying in National Embedded Air Quality Monitoring Program. The, the durations are mentioned like sometimes it will be 24 hours for whole week, sometimes eight hour in one day, but average of seven days like that. It is given okay. that we will share with you in that nothing much okay. technical part is there. Okay, so let me ask one question. Hello, actually your voice uh, is. Uh, uh, can you slightly louder? Sir, I have one more question. Ah, please go ahead. So, for example, uh, I have to uh, monitor the CH4 emission from the rice field. Hmm. So, it is possible to uh, manual mo mo automatic analysis? No, you have to understand one thing. CH4 basically is methane, right? It is one of the greenhouse gases, correct? Hello. 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 Yeah. CH4 is is a one of the greenhouse gas. Are yes, you able sir. to hear hear me? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir. I can ah, hear CH4. You. Yeah. CH4 is one of the uh, one of the greenhouse gas. So if you want to uh, measure it near a rice mill, 
you have two options. There are some uh, automatic uh, uh, automatic instruments which we will go on site. There will be one tube, and that tube you can insert in the particular waste where it will uh, suck it up from the tube and give you the methane. But that is not a very accurate method. The other one is that you have to collect the gas sample sampler in tetler bags, small tetler bags, one liter or five liter capacity, and you have to do the gas chromatograph. Okay. Hmm. Okay, sir. thank you. Any other? Hello, sir. Yes, go ahead. Well, sir, uh, can you once more explain that uh, parameter selection? Hmm. Sure. May I know who is this? Sir, this Nimi. Huh? Yes. Nimmi. Nimmi. Okay. Parameter selection basically. See, uh, there are uh, there are two things. Of course, when we are uh, going for a uh, for a monitoring program, we should know where and what means where to put the instrument and what to measure. Right. So, if it is a sensitive location means there is a, there, there is some hospital or there is some significant community or crowd there socks and knocks anyway we have to measure from it okay socks and knocks these are all guidelines that anyway we, we have to take our call if it is a sensitive location if suppose you have put a station where you are specifically want to see the health impact okay then you have to measure all the pollutants which i have mentioned in this slide all this Okay. If you if you just want to see the uh, population and exposure kind of thing where impact may not be there, but they will only be exposed, then you have to select all the criteria pollutants. That criteria pollutants also are given in the National Ambient Air Quality Monitoring Program. Okay. These are three things which which were independent of road. Okay. By now I have not spoken anything about the road. Now let's say you want to measure on the road, then you have to go to the curb side, maybe traffic intersection, and there you have to measure criteria pollutant plus carbon monoxide also because carbon monoxide is a significant emission from vehicular traffic. Okay, that is fourth point. And fifth point, downtown. As I told you earlier that in every city, there will be some downtown, which is not that higher livelihood, but there will be significant crowd and some small market also. In, the, in those kind of cases, you have to first accumulatively see all other things. Plus, your instrument should be 50 meter away from the intersection. In that case, you have to do all the criteria pollutants plus ozone also. That is what the parameter selection is. Now, now the, 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 uh, the question is, why is it so that I am giving CO, carbon monoxide, when there is a traffic intersection, but when there is no traffic, only uh, community, there I am uh, giving criteria pollutants plus ozone. That question you should uh, you should ponder over it. Anyway, that I'll ask you. <laughs> so uh, it is clear to you, Nimbi? Okay, sir. Any other? Okay, we'll go ahead. Now, first thing we will see the for particulate uh, monitoring. Okay, now if you see a particular particle will have a composition of so many things. Okay, there will be some moisture, water, some smoke, dirt, soot particles, sulfates, uh, dust, carbon, some aerosols also, which would have generated from somewhere, heavy metals. Hmm. Some soil particles, some some uh, uh, some component of salt like Na or Cl, and polyaromatic hydrocarbons, organics, and sometimes nitrate also are observed. So that will be the particle composition. Okay, so in that particle, what you have to uh, understand is that if the particle is less than 2.5 microns, we categorize as PM 2.5. 2.5 here denotes the 
diameter of that particular particle. Now, one thing you need to understand that when we when we work in air environment, we assume that the shape of the particle is spherical. Okay, though it may not be spherical truly, but because we want to do modeling and we want to do any certain kind of thing, we need to understand. So we have assumed that the uh, shape of the particle is spherical. Okay, and then PM 2.5, PM 10, and if it is less than 100 micron, it is also called as total particulate matter, TPM. Okay, total particulate matter, but generally we see PM10 and PM2.5. So what we do is that we will uh, uh, take one filter paper. From that air will pass and a particulate monitoring is usually complete with manual measurement. And then we have to do subsequent laboratory analysis. In the in many of the cases, gravimetric analysis is used. OK, so you can see here first we will uh, take a filter paper and we'll measure the initial weight. OK, we'll measure the initial weight. Then the air has passed through it. Of course, the dust particles are, uh, are are stick to it. So its weight would have been increased. We'll take the final weight. And then based on this change, we can find out the in how much air, how much gram of particles were there. And then we can very easily convert it to microgram per meter cube, which is the unit given by NAPS. Here also you can see that filter paper before sampling clean and white, and after sampling it is slightly blackish and grayish. Okay, this is particulate monitoring. And for uh, other uh, gases sample, we have to take the filter paper, then we have to liquefy it in such a way that I can extract things from it. Okay, and there are uh, well established uh, uh, measurement units for that. Okay, that much uh, we will not be able to see now because it's a laboratory related uh, procedures. Only thing is that it uh, for that a chemical laboratory is required. Okay, you have to keep in mind when chemical laboratory is required, you have to transfer the pollutants from that in such a way that it will be collected. And there are tubes also. Apart from paper, there are tubes also in the instrument in which it will be directly uh, collected, the gaseous samples. Okay, and as you all know, certain uh, chemical has certain uh, frequency of uh, refraction based on that this NOx and SOx will be measured in instrument. OK. Now. PM10, PM2, 2.5 other things are done. Now we have to see the meteorological data marking unit. So uh, this is just an example of how a, 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 a on field meteorological unit or observatory looks like. So here it will record the wind speed and wind direction. In that there will be one uh, instrument, one sensor which will show the air temperature as well as humidity also. There will be one rain gauge station which will, which will give the uh, rainfall. Here it will be leaf wetness. What is the wetness in the atmosphere? And it will give the solar radiation. Okay. And at the same time, with, uh, with the use of some other things, we can measure soil temperature and soil moisture. Also, so it is a complete set of other meteorological department, uh, other uh, meteorological data we use. Not all will be required at all, but wind speed and direction, air temperature and humidity and rainfall. These are the most prominent ones which we require in any case, okay, which we require in any case. And using the wind speed and wind direction, there are many online tools and you can draw manually also this windows diagram in which they length and the width is directly proportional to the strength of the speed as well as its magnitude in meter per second square. That anyway, some assignment will be given to you, so you will be able to watch. Okay, so up to this one, any doubt? Otherwise, we will just see, see the brief of air quality modeling. Okay, now, Sir, can you, you know, please explain it again? These two previous slides, PM gas sampling process instruments and uh, meteorological data. Yes, yes, I can. So uh, here, uh, up to this point, is clear particulate monitoring. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. 
No, what I was saying is that in, in gas sample, there will be some tube along with the instrument itself, or sometimes we can extract a part of the gases from filter paper also. There are methods for it because that will anyway stuck to it. And these tubes with in certain instrument, when you put it, it, it will give you the NOx and SOx uh, measurement from that particular gas. Like this instrument, what you are seeing is that it's a, uh, it's a spectrometer. Okay, we can do using spectrometry also. So nitrogen will have certain frequency. If I, uh, I don't uh, remember correctly, but something like 220 micrometer and SOx has something particular frequency. On both this frequency, if the reflection peak is there, its concentration can be uh, determined. That is how we measure gas. Okay, here it, it is uh, it is not full. Full procedure is not given because this is a titrimetric method and which we cannot fully uh, describe here. That's what I said that it is it has been done using the instruments. And second slide, this meteorological uh, uh, data monitoring, I was saying that there are uh, observatories which we put it on field. There will be one part which will uh, record the wind speed and wind direction. There will be second part which will record the air temperature and humidity. And there will be one uh, rain gauge station with which will measure the rainfall. Okay, same instrument. It will be measuring soil temperature and soil moisture. One, one part will be there which will be measuring the leaf wetness and other one will be measuring the solar radiation. But in most of the cases when we do EIA, the more concern uh, parameter for us will be wind speed and direction, air temperature and humidity and rainfall. This, if these three things are known to us, we can very well proceed with the air quality modeling. That is what I was saying. And if you wish to uh, see and, and learn these gases samples also, we have our uh, own laboratory recorded videos that we can share with you. So from first to start, our research scholars have uh, created some videos. They will they have recorded it and that we can show you. That anyway we'll share with you. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Now we will very briefly see the we will very briefly see how this air quality modeling has been carried out. And today I will just uh, tell the basic of it. And fourth and fifth day, we, fourth and fifth day, we will see how it was done. Sir, uh, yeah, yeah, Rifu Sir, I, I want to know that how to uh, study that wind rose diagram. No, that is unable to, that I'm unable to understand that one. And so what that graph okay, shows, then, how to interpret that actually interpretation of that uh, graph. No. OK, OK, no, but we'll do one thing today. This recorded uh, the recorded uh, lecture you see, and I will also share one five minute video in which very easy uh, format. It has been shown that how to uh, plot and study windrows diagram and meanwhile you you do this fourth day we will see the actual application of it okay, okay it is sir. better we should go ahead now uh, all yeah. right sir but uh, interpretation of that uh, uh, windrows diagram is that i want to uh, explain it in next yes, slides yes. or next session no another no no it is there sessions. but first i want you to see all right sir. Okay, sir. okay okay uh, for a hint you can uh, for the hint uh, this much i can give you that You able to see my sites or, or report them on? Yes, sir. I can see that. Yeah, no. Uh, just just to give you the hint, you can see the directions are there, right? South is northwest, and you can see the length of the spoke is also varying. Ah, huh? correct. Sir, yes, sir, correct. Uh, no, and then width is also varying. This particular width. Yes, sir. Uh, now, for each color, there is one bar. Yes, you can see here, right? Now, suppose this green color is here. Hmm? Green is six yes. to eight meter per second. And what is the direction? Northwest. Hello? Hello? Yes, sir, I can hear you. But uh, I think there are a lot of background noise from whenever you on your mic. Are you in a community setting? 
Yes, sir, little bit. That's why. Ah, that's why. Okay, so now I give you almost fifty to sixty percent of the hint of Windows diagram. But anyway, that you all have to plot. I will. I will. I further course of time you will come to know. Now you can very well see that if this color is there and it is on this bar, then it means in this direction. This wind direction is six to eight meter per second. Sir, so through wind wind rose diagram. Hello. Yeah. 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 Good. Uh, through wind rose diagram, we find out uh, calm area along with direction. Can you please explain how to calculate those? Calm area. Yes, sir. No, actually, in I've this case. It. Yes, yes. You have read, but uh, first we have to connect it also with our work. Actually, what we do is that uh, you just below the windows diagram, you see I'm I'm plotting something. Let's say this is a mind lease. Okay, this rectangular block. Are you able to see? Yes, yes, sir. Ah, okay, okay. This is a mind lease, and just imagine that this windows diagram is superimposed on this mind lease. Okay. Okay, imagine. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am listening. Ha. Huh. Now you can see that if this particular windows diagram, it is clearly seen that westward wind wind is more from east to west, looking to the spokes and bar, right? Hello. Yes, sir. Ha. Huh. Okay. You you got up to this point? Yes, sir. So in this case, when there is empty areas. This will be upwind. This will be downwind. Downwind. And these are crosswind. Okay. So you have to take four sample from each one and one sample from the mine itself. This five sample you have to take. Some area, I think uh, this theoretical is there somewhere, but practically this is what we do. And as the word indicates, calm area means when the, the when the wind wind is in a such a way. Uh, Tell me. Actually, that's in weather monitoring. Calm area we are finding. Ah, uh, your voice is not clear. Hello. Hello. Yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> Sir, we are finding out calm areas and direction in weather monitoring. Here we oh. are learning about wind speed and direction. That's why I I wanted to know. Then it will be uh, then it will be good if you can frame your question and put it on the group. We will uh, see which case it is falling, and we can uh, prepare a reply to it. Now yes. to to the best of understanding of me, that is what I have shared with you. Immediately I am not aware of uh, that particular calm area and its connection with the theme of the course. But if you share it with properly, and if you can give some example, we can very well do it. And okay, it will sir. be good. It will be good for others also. Okay. Okay, we can proceed with our. Hmm. Okay. Topic. Okay. So uh, now, uh, up to this point, we have seen the uh, air pollutants. Then we have seen the sources of air pollutants, and we have seen the marketing program. Then we have seen the selection of site, selection of parameters, and all those things. Now I will just give a brief of what what all different uh, air quality models we use when we uh, carry out prediction. Okay, so I would like to draw your attention to this particular point. See, this is where we started from. Okay, this is where we started from. We have seen that uh, what all parameter to be seen, existing air quality level, whether it has potential, potential to disperse or not, basic meteorological data, and all other things. Now we have reached to step six or seven, where we will try to, where we will try to predict based on the existing data. Okay, we will try to predict based on the Existing data. Now, in this case, when we are doing uh, modeling studies, 
the model itself will have different applications. Like if you want to obtain some permit, you want to do some source apportionment studies, you want to predict the impact, which is what the theme of our course also. You want to do forecasting. You want to rover between two or more different mitigation options. You want to give compliance. Suppose your project has already obtained the environmental clearance and uh, as a post environmental clearance, there is a condition that you have to maintain a particular level of PM10 in your area. So whether it is complying or not, that also you can uh, you can do using the using the uh, air quality models and of course public information and policy decisions. So there are different models which will have different applications, but you have to keep in mind that when when you do EIA, the single most uh, single most important modeling activity which should be channelized towards the prediction of future impacts, future impacts as well as with and without scenarios. Okay, with and without scenarios as well as future impacts. Now, based on this, based on its uh, movement of air, based on the applicability of the model, there are five types of models we have. First one is Gaussian models. As you all know, Gauss theorem is a very famous theorem and uh, it is a three dimensional uh, theorem. So, uh, it is a theorem which includes all three dimensions of model dispersion and it gives a uh, prediction. Okay, so Gaussian models, it is the most good mo models for estimates of dispersion from mistakes, basically from stakes and available for area sources and urban areas. Okay, second one is a box model. This is uh, on the basis of budget analysis. Okay, budget analysis means you, uh, uh, you must have heard this term called mass balance. So this principle says that whatever there is input and whatever there is output, this should be equal. If it is not equal, we have to find out where in between it is dispersed or in between absorbed. So it works on the principle of uh, box models. Third one is statistical models, which is based upon the established uh, relationships, like some, some regression models or some stochastic models or some linear models like that. Okay, then comes a numerical uh, mathematical models which are based on the continuity equations. Continuity equations like newton dobson method, you would have heard of this newton dobson methods and other method. And the last one is trajectory or puff models. As the word indicates puff means something is sticked and they disperse on the land or, or on the atmosphere. So these are puff models. Okay, and these are based on uh, upon the knowledge of the wind field and the variation of winds. And it is suited for dispersion from single source at larger distances or in cases with dispersion time. So one thing what I want to tell you is that in EIA, this trajectory and puff model and Gaussian models, both are mostly used. And how it is used is this. Let's say if, if your prediction area is less than 10 kilometers. Okay. Your prediction area is less than 10 kilometers, then you will use Gaussian model. And if your prediction area is more than 10 kilometer, then you will use trajectory or puff model. That's why it is also suitable for uh, dispersion at larger distances. Okay, so this 10 kilometer is, it is not a thumb rule or something, but it is on the basis of experience or years of experience which people are doing EIA, that after 10 kilometer, Gaussian model will not give correct values when you do ground truthing, but the puff model will give. But at the same time, if you apply puff model in less than 10 kilometer, it will not give the correct value. So you keep in mind that when you do EIA, Gaussian model and trajectory model is used. If it is the buffer area is less than 10 kilometer, you will use Gaussian model. And if the buffer area is more than 10 kilometer, you will, you will use trajectory or puff model. Okay. I hope it is clear to you. Now, with this, what are different applications are there for model application? So suppose if you want to do some uh, uh, impact planning or forecast, then you can use air mode, planning mitigation impact, air quiz, planning or forecast for permits, you want to obtain permits, ADMS file, and this kind of data it will take, like line or traffic, area or grid, and point or industry. I hope now you uh, clearly understand what is uh, area source, what is line source, and what is point source. So this one actually, 
I want one more thing. I want to clarify you. This model. This uh, you don't go with the uh, name of the model. The underlying mathematics will be same. Keep, keep this in mind. Underlying mathematics will be same only. This is based on the uh, user interface of that particular software will be different. Means these are all uh, different software only, but the mathematics will be using the same. But their inputting of data, the, the calculation part, and the graphical user interface will be different. That is what the uh, model name is, and they will customize it in such a way that it will use the same mathematics. Still, it will be very helpful for you for a particular need. Like if you only want to take a permit for a, a small industry, or if you want to take a permit for a large industry, like that. Okay. Now, uh, as I told you earlier that Gaussian Kluge model is the most important one. So just we'll see the uh, some basics of that. OK, now. Suppose there is some industry. And this is a particular stake. There is one industry and there is a particular stake and it has a particular stake height. Let's say it is capital H. OK, if there is some emission, it will not be straight away go like this. Neither it will go like this. It will form a certain trajectory because there will be both the things. Okay, so up to this point, it is known as stake height. Up to this point, it is known as plume rise. Okay, it is called as a plume. And suppose this is a x direction. So 90 degree to that on a horizontal plane, it will be y direction. And 90 degree to that horizontal plane, that will be z direction. So there will be dispersion in both the direction. Right, it will move in horizontal plane also. It will move in vertical plane also. So when it is moving in horizontal plane, the dispersion plot will be like this. And when it is moving in vertical plane, the dispersion plot will be like this. Both we require to calculate the dispersion potential of that. And when suppose if there is some land use or if there is some house, then we have to see if 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 it falls on the ground. What will be the GLC? What will be the ground level concentration of that air pollution? Okay. And at any point of given time, the concentration will be given by release rate divided by wind speed into dispersion. Release rate will be like this much microgram per meter cube per hour or this much microgram per meter cube per second, like that. Okay, this is a particular Gaussian plume model. And when you are when you are doing modeling in this case, it will be Rovering around either in x direction, like in a horizontal plane, or z direction, vertical plane. Okay, this. Uh, okay, just now only I explained when someone asked me this, how uh, like related to calm area. But anyway, that we will see afterwards. So you see here, uh, when you are planning sampling, it will be like suppose if air is flowing toward this side. Okay, so this will be upwind. This will be downwind as you mentioned, and this will be crosswind. So you have to consider this kind of coordinate system for that so that you will be able to decide the sampling locations in your case. And at the same time, this is just a part only to make you understand the direction. And I told you just now that there will be some different profiles at different lengths. There is a possibility that length L, there will be some profile, then other profile and, and some different profile. And here only vertical profile, sorry, horizontal profile is shown, but there may be vertical profile also in Z direction because it will move in all three directions. So uh, when you are uh, doing the modeling, these two, three things you have to keep in mind that what is crosswind, what is downwind, upwind, and what is the plume height and other parameters. Okay. Then, uh, okay, uh, uh, just now I told you already that uh, Gaussian model uh, model simplify the turbulence to be especially homogeneous, case constant, and the wind speed to be constant with height. So any mathematical model will work on certain assumptions. Okay, any mathematical model will work on certain assumptions. So here we assume that the turbulence is especially homogeneous, especially means which is distributed in XY plane especially means which is distributed in X, Y plane. OK, and the wind speed to be constant with height. And we are also uh, assuming that wind speed is not varying with height. It is constant. And of course, as, as I already said, it is one of the efficient and effective tools for calculating pool uh, plume dispersion from point sources. And when the 
when the terrain is complex and wind speeds are low or boundary layer structure is complex means it means it is a hilly region or something then it will this applicability will be less it is mostly good for plain terrain okay it is mostly good for plain terrain and there are three types of uh, three basic types we have a steady state segmented and up trajectory what we have already discussed with you now this is the formula which we uh, use uh, which which uh, we do when we are mathematically calculating it manually so i will know i will not go in detail of it but i will be sharing you this slide well, q is release rate h is effective height and sigma and sigma z are dispersion parameters as i said earlier there will always be two one in y direction one in z direction because in both way it can vary okay now i want to uh, uh, draw your attention to one more important point that we know that there is a source okay we also know that there is a, a receptor there is a, a receptor in between there is some chemical changes happens which changes the let's say here the concentration is x microgram per meter cube and after reaching here it will be something like y microgram per meter cube so in between there is there are some changes okay in between there are some changes first thing is that because of tree and other things it will be removed some part will be removed the, the trees and the leaves and all uh, and the, the the tree structure system attenuates the pollution okay it takes the gases and releases it okay some part of it will be transformed to some part of it will be transformed to other chemicals because of the photonic reaction like we we have seen in earlier that uh, so2 was converted to so4 and then settled and some part will be lost in advection and some will be diffusion can any one of you tell me the difference between advection and diffusion okay anyway i will i will just uh, tell you suppose it's a this box is a pollutant box of let's say some x quantity okay it is some x quantity this is a pollutant air pollutant and this is a particular length l okay and keep in mind that i am assuming it as a parcel of air okay i am assuming it as a parcel of air so suppose if this parcel of air moves from point point a to point b without change in the concentration of that box itself it will be called advection okay it will be called advection means it has travel but that particular parcel of air whatever it may be 1 meter cube 2 meter cube 5 meter cube the concentration in that parcel is same but if this has moved and the concentration is increased or decreased mostly it will be decreased only let's say from x it has become 0.5x then it will be diffusion okay up to this one clear so i hope trans uh, transformation advection diffusion and removal are clear to you and then ultimately it will lead to the lead to the receptor which is v a human being okay now of, of course this kind of flow models are used for permits uh, uh, assessment of impact and to evaluate the needed stake height to meet air quality limit and estimate future contribution from planned or single sources okay now now when uh, when uh, i'll just give you an example of how this uh, dispersion model air mode works so here we will give some input uh, uh, input data okay here we will uh, give all those input things what we are uh, giving in our uh, what i have shown you in my earlier slide okay so this this thing which is here mentioned in software terms it will be like this land use land cover upper air meteorological data hourly surface meteorological data one minute meteorological data and all other things okay then it will go to the modeling activity where it will calculate based on the hour output okay based on the hour output whatever we want 
and then it will give you an output based on our grid and based on our terrain data. I'll give you an example also on this one. So here you can see I have given all my sources. Okay, the, these are the sorry, these are the line sources. I have given that here pollution may be there. Like this, there will be commands to give point source, area source, volume source, line source, all other things. And based on my meteorological data, what I showed you in previous slide, it will generate prune dispersion. So here you can see, here it is giving output in microgram per meter cube. And this particular color pertains to particular pollutant. So here I can see that if that particular activity comes or if that particular activity implemented, there will be a pollution of uh, 80 microgram per meter cube in this area. And you can see in the background, this area is there. I hope you are able to see in the background, this area is super important. So you can see here on the green tree, on the green tree, the pollution will be like between 20 to 40 microgram per meter cube, which is less than the 100 microgram per meter cube of range. But whatsoever color are there above this, this yellow, orange, and this, this should be taken seriously. Like here, you can see this is uh, above 184 microgram per meter cube. So this is how a particular uh, model will give you the output. Okay, I hope it is clear to you. Now, uh, before I go to the AQA, we are almost reached to the last slides. I hope from the start, it is clear to you. And these were the steps, the steps you have uh, taken care. We have to take, uh, we have to follow to carry out EIA. Then what are the air pollution? It's introduction, air pollution sources, it's classification. It, then uh, I also brief you of indoor air pollution, then classification of HAPs and how to do monitoring. I have also shown you very basic and minute and very important things regarding site selection and parameter selection, particulate monitoring, gaseous uh, sample monitoring, meteorological uh, data, then wind rows, then different types of uh, models we use, types of models, then some basics of Gaussian plume model, its coordinate system, how we should use it, and Gaussian plume model, its mathematical formula, and fate of pollutant. In mostly in that the four for uh, processes which occurs in the system and how a typical uh, model looks like. Okay, now I'll just give a brief of what air quality index is. As you all know that uh, all, all, all the general public will not be aware of this technical term. So we have to devise some index which will be, which will be helpful in giving civic sense to the science. Okay, civic sense means uh, you, you are doing science, but you are giving civic sense to it, means general public can also read. Okay, for that, we require air quality index. These things I have already told you that there are many health issues related to it. That I, anyway, I'm coming on one more slide. And there is an air quality index, which we use for denoting our air quality. So if it is between 0 to 50, it is good. 51 to 100 satisfactory, 101 to 200 moderately polluted, 201 to 300 poor, very poor and severe. And like that, we calculate the air quality. The calculation part is very easy. It's not very uh, complex. We will uh, take certain pollutants from X1 to Xn. Then we will do sub-indexing of that. We will give some weightage to it. We will multiply it and we will find one aggregate index. It is just like X1, Y1 plus X2, Y2 divided by x1 plus x2. The calculation part is not that complex of AQI. And you will reach to one particular air quality index, then you can declare what will be the air quality index. Okay, and similarly, we, you can also show it using a uh, color bar and different, different uh, air quality durations. Hello? Okay. So, as I said earlier, there will be durations given like CO for 1 and 8 hours, SPM for 24 hours, NO2 for 20 hours, ozone for 8 hours, PM10 for 24 hours. With that, I will convert it to sub-indices and I will come to a particular AQI index. Okay. 
and uh, as far as health is concerned, there are some health related things in that which I will not read now. And these are the he health impact for uh, uh, for particulate matter PM10 and PM2.5, which will lead to respiratory diseases, carc carcinogenicity, which causes cancer, toxicity. OK, any allergy visibility reduction. Nitrogen dioxide will be like if you are already having some problem, it will it will aggregate that specifically cardiovascular diseases and other kind of things. OK, so like that each particular component is associated with particular health disease. OK. So this is also there, but this I'll share with you. This is theory, so I, I don't think I should go ahead with it. So I would like like you all to discuss with me what all uh, challenges you face today or how it is uh, going, whether you are able to grasp or not. At least from four to five people, I want some feedback. And if you have any doubt that you can ask me first. Then we'll see the further course of action. Anyone? Hello, sir. Hello, yes. Uh, upcoming class, we are going to do this modeling like AERO, AERO MOD models like that. It is then able to do the demonstration of that model, that uh, model in the software is possible in the upcoming class. Uh, you mean to say uh, uh, demonstration of the software, modeling yes. software? Yeah, yes. actually, yeah, actually, Ajay, th that is not the scope of this course. This course is primarily at the remote sensing application in EIA. So remote yes. sensing application, in any case, we will be doing it with you. But for other things, I am touching these areas because that mapping and other things are part of remote sensing. But air quality yes. modeling, water quality modeling, nice pollution modeling is not in the scope of this course. This You can see the title is Remote sensing and GIS applications in environmental impact and management. So I'm only. Can... Hello. Yes, sir. So we can continue. Yeah. So I'm only uh, touching those areas of this component which is required to do remote sensing in EIA. Okay. Uh, but uh, remote sensing anyway, uh, land use land core analysis, superimposition, all those things you will be doing by yourself, and software also you will be installing today evening. We will send you one guideline. For installing so the software I, and so like we are doing with the but with this model we can able to integrate this uh, model to remote sensing it is possible yes 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 that is what i'm trying to th say see eia is a very broad field so air quality is one expertise water quality is one expertise you will be able to integrate but to integrate first you should know the full basics of remote sensing okay OK, yeah, and, and and also remote sensing plays a big role in all these things because the input for a land use land cover analysis, input for water quality, input for all those things, these maps, sources and all can only be given when you know remote sensing and GIS. Yes, yes, yes. That's why yeah, that's why we are uh, attaching this area. Nimbi and. Yes, sir. Yeah. Any uh, anything except uh, you you will post that down group. I'll note it down. Farm area and related to that one query is there, na? No? Huh? Yes, sir. It's not me. Uh, oh, yes, sir. Then I that think was my so question. Pradhana, Pradhana. Okay, Pradhana. I guess. Maybe I'll just clarify you, Pradhana, how to exactly interpret. A Uh, Pradhana, can you see my screen? Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. And, uh, I'm mute. There is some disturbance. OK, so this is a Windows plot. OK, you can easily plot this using a software called WR plot. It's an open access software. Anybody can download it uh, from Google WR plot and the input is things are how, for how much period like one week or one month. The number of days in an Excel sheet you can just uh, the first column days 
the second column the wind speed and the third column wind direction this data you can easily obtain from any weather forecasting data or imd or something and the input to the wr plot is the excel sheet and it will generate this windrows diagram that's called the wr plot so coming to the calm area it's not actually the calm area it's the calm period the central link you can see now where it is mentioned calm 5.8 percentage so it, it is meant that this windrows plot is plotted between July 1st, 1996 to April 1st, 2024. Okay. In this period, it states that 5.8 percentage of the time there was calm winds. Calm wind means almost negligible winds. There is no significant wind uh, activity during that period, almost uh, zero or one meter per second, something. Or you can see that two miles per hour less than are called the calm values. And uh, these concentric circles, what you see uh, is the uh, frequency. Uh, uh, at which uh, the uh, predominant wind direction is there. So here you can see the predominant wind direction is from the uh, south, from south to north. From south to north. Yeah. So that's how the, 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 the spokes represents the uh, the predominant wind direction. Okay. So when the WR uh, the wind rose is generated, it gives you like whether the wind flow is flowing from or to. So accordingly, you have to interpret. So most probably 90% the wind rows will predict from only certain wind rows plots will be from two. So in the opposite direction, you have to interpret. So this is from only. So it gives you the arrows. So the predominant direction is wind direction is from south to north. So regarding the calm period, you have understood, right? The central circle, whatever gives uh, uh, the 5.8 percentage of the whole um a monitoring period like from 96 to 2024 uh, that is a calm period where the no significant wind was observed that Basically, is how we are calculating calm period not yes. not that calm area not a calm area it's the calm okay. period it's why is the calm period significant uh, uh, in a windrows plot can you tell me no sir the calm period means there is no significant wind and if there is an industry which is emitting a lot of uh, the pollution, then if there is no wind, uh, there is no dispersion. So ultimately it creates what? Deposition of all the pollutants at one place. Yes. Right? It, it is like an extreme event. So that is why this calm period is very significant while doing this environmental uh, uh, air monitoring studies and all. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, can anyone tell me what is the difference between pollutant and contaminant? Yes, sir. Contaminant means uh, uh, such substances which are needed but up to certain limit. They are needed. If uh, if limit is uh, exceeding, hmm. if certain limit is exceeding in our sample, hmm. that will be considered as contaminant. Or I'm wrong. Like what is polluting? Pollutant is not needed at all. Contaminant may not be harmful. OK. It is not uh, by default. Uh, it's not. It may be uh, in the nature, but uh, pollutant uh, causes significant risk or harm to the human. Uh, over to you, sir. Okay, so uh, Pradna, that uh, calm area, yes. actually uh, even I was not aware of that, but we were doing uh, unintentionally that earlier, so I told you that there will be 
choose my case. Okay, there will be one central uh, location uh, where we will be measuring. So ultimately, we were measuring at calm area only. But we were not named as it, it is a calm area or something because I have not come across uh, before that. So basically, you can approach both the things. What I have shared with you, upwind, downwind, two crosswind, one center, and what Shavan sir has shared. Yes, sir, sir has clarified. Yes. Anyone else? Sir, selection of prediction area depends upon the project. Yes, yes, because uh, uh, I said na, in chapter two, you have to clearly define the, uh, the study area, what all uh, units are there in your uh, developmental activity. And based on that only, you will be deciding the study area. And one more thing, one more thing, uh, you are asking about the prediction area. Na? So if suppose the uh, quantum of the pollutants, which are likely to generate it from the project is less, you can take five kilometer as the buffer, or if it is more than five, uh, or if the quantum of pollutant to be generated is more, you can you have to take 10 kilometer radius. So prediction area will depend upon that. And if you are doing regional EIA or sectoral EIA, it will be more 50 kilometer or 100 kilometer radius from that particular industrial cluster. Like that, we have to select the prediction area. Anyone else? Okay, so with this, we have come to the end of the first day. Some other things are remaining, water, noise, socioeconomic and ecology and biodiversity. But during the course of time, one by one, uh, I will be taking those things also. Now, before six o'clock, I will be sharing with you one software installation guideline that you have to download and install. Also, I'll be sharing with you one satellite image, raw satellite image. It is requested that you take that satellite image and store it at a particular folder where you will be working on the third day, that is the after tomorrow, when there will be hands on. That day we are fully devoting to hands on practice. Okay, and the recordings of this class plus PDF of what I have uh, taken lectures and what Shavant has taken, that also I will be uploading on a drive. Day wise, I'll write, I, I'll make a folder named day one that you can download it from there and you can see it will not be there for always so you can download early. Okay. Anyone else? Anything? Otherwise, we, we will wind up for today. So, well, ladies and gentlemen, that's all for today. See you tomorrow then. And anything is there, you please don't hesitate to uh, put on the group. And I expect a maximum participation from your side. Okay, have a nice day.